They say if you live one place long enough, you are that place. My name is Anthony Desiato, and I've lived in Westchester, New York my entire life. This season, I'll be telling my county story through her comic shops, capturing a microcosm of the comics industry during the pivotal 1990s. Alternate Realities was, and always will be, my comic shop. But it's time to revisit my first shops, the quintessential stores of the area and the era that are now no more. Everything comes full circle this season with the final piece of my comic shop history. Welcome to season five of my comic shop history. I am your host, Anthony Desiato. We begin our tour through the Westchester comic shop scene that was with Heroes World in White Plains. And joining me for this episode is legendary returning guest, former retailer, Steve Odo. Not so legendary, but okay. So longtime listeners of this show, of course, know you very well for your role at Alternate Realities. In 1992, you founded AR in Scarsdale with two other gentlemen, Gene Doherty and Kevin Halstead, and the store underwent numerous permutations in ownership over 23 years, but you were the store's most consistent presence Mm -hmm. throughout those 23 years, right up until you closed the store in 2015. And of course, that's where this podcast began. But even though we mostly know you from alternate realities, and inevitably, you know, we'll, we'll definitely touch on alternate realities in this episode and this season, the reason you're here is actually to talk about a different store, Heroes World, in White Plains, uh, in the Galleria Mall, where you were not only a customer, but you were also, and I was very surprised to learn this, and I only learned this within the past couple of years, a one-time employee. Uh, yeah, I was a part-timer there. Yeah. yeah. But I had no idea. For oh, all okay. the time that you and I spent together, I had never, I, and I can't remember exactly when this came up or how it came up, but I was very surprised to learn. And it works out great because now this gives us this whole other area to, to talk about uh, and explore. Well, let's see. Um, again, this is so long ago. What are we looking at? Uh, early, late 80s? No, early 90s? Something well, so like I want to so step back for a second. So we're, we'll go through the timeline and we'll unpack everything. But just to kind of tee up this episode and even this entire season, you know, the theme is my county's comic shop history, Westchester County. When you guys sat down to uh, pick a location for alternate realities, if memory serves, you pulled out a map and you took a look at Westchester and where the other stores were. Can you tell me a little bit about what the, the Westchester comic scene was like at that time when you sat down to, in the early 90s to open AR? Okay, well, I guess we started thinking about it in early 92. So what I had done is taken a, a map of lower Westchester, um, put it on a board, and uh, I didn't use push pins. I used the post-its. And I, I wrote down the name of each store and its address, uh, posted it all over the map to show where the different locations were. And essentially at that time, it was the boom for comic book shops. And uh, I'd say almost every little town in Westchester had a shop, at, le- at least one shop. Um, and so basically using that, we looked at it and said, at it and said where's, where's that big gap of space that we can take? And, um, you know, taking that into consideration as well as, um, a lo- you know, a location that would be decent, um, there weren't too many choices. And at the time also, there were a lot of, uh, there was, a, it was almost full occupancy among the uh, commercial spots in Westchester. So there weren't too many places that we could even uh, consider. Um, <clears throat> in the end, of course, we chose our location, which was only... Uh, what a half a mile away from Dragon's Den, which people thought we were crazy. Um, but again, at that time, the location was okay. It had plenty of free parking, and um, and the rent was doable, or we thought it was doable at the time. Um, and and so base and again, as time wore on, it didn't take too many years. All the different shops, all those posts started disappearing because they all started closing. You know, at last of them all. Well, almost all of them. Just you know. about. We used to have that joke about having a Deadpool where we'd all throw in like $1,000 and uh, all the stores, and then whoever survived would get to keep it. But uh, Oh, you yeah. talked about this with the other stores? Some of the other stores. But, but, um, but realistically, if we had done that, we would not be collecting because some of those guys are still around. Yeah, no, yeah, I mean, but it's, there it's are, interesting. I'd say, I'd, say, I'd say there were easily 24 different stores around Westchester County. Not, not all necessarily 
comic book stores. Uh, you know, some were baseball cards with some comics. But um, I think at that time it was still early, so that Magic the Gathering wasn't the big thing, so it wasn't so much gaming stores. Um, it was basically comic shops. Uh, most of them not too well run. Um, some of them were actually just like, um, uh, not a hobby for the owners, but the owners might have a real job and then go to their shop at three or four o'clock in the afternoon, open up for a few hours and maybe do that like four or five times a week. So just a little more of a lifestyle business, <coughs> not, uh, yeah. not a main source of income. Yeah. But again, you had the bigger stores and you had, uh, you know, Dragon's Den of course was the, the was the monolith, but, um, cause they, I think. Over time, they must have had like four locations. Um, you know, each one again right. collapsed over time. But um, yeah, no, I mean it's it's amazing because you know the the Westchester comic shop scene of today is very different. And so, you know, I want to speak just for a moment about why this season uh, is is focused around the Westchester comic shop uh, scene. So you know, and when I was thinking about what I wanted the fifth season of this podcast to be. Uh, I knew I wanted to do something a little bit more personal. I had spent a couple of seasons talking about how to run a comic shop and how to run a convention. And I enjoyed that a lot. I really love discussing the ins and outs and uh, the business side of, of both you know stores and conventions. But I was so steeped in it between the podcast and even more so the documentary, My Comic Shop Country. And so I knew coming into this season, I wanted to do something a little a little bit more personal. And I went back, as I always do, to the title of the show, My Comic Shop History. And obviously, Alternate Realities was the biggest part of My Comic Shop History. But there were these other Westchester shops that did play a role in My Comic Shop History uh, that I went to for various periods of time. And so I thought, there's a lot I don't know about these stores. I was so little. There's a lot I don't even remember. So it would be interesting to sort of reminisce about what I do recall and learn more about the stores from the people who either own them or work there uh, or, or shop there, fellow customers. So that was sort of the, the personal side of it. And then as I was thinking about all of these stores, and when we're talking about these big Westchester stores that specifically were part of my comic shop history, we're talking about Heroes World and Dragon's Den and American Legends, uh, or at the time was one of by cards, two of by comics, alternate realities, of course, uh, and, a, and a couple of others. And as I'm thinking about all of these, I realize they're all gone, or in the case of one of by cards, changed now. And so in terms of, you know, what makes a season like this maybe a little relevant or even timely, I think it's the fact that it really kind of uh, captures a microcosm of the industry as a whole, um, because we did have this period where there were so many stores, there was this boom, and then the bust, and I think you see that play out in Westchester. So I feel like if you're from this area and you know the stores, I think it'll be cool to hear about them. But if you're not, if you're not familiar with Westchester, uh, I, again, I think it kind of speaks to larger themes and issues about the industry as a whole. And that's kind of how we ended up here. Mm. I mean, I guess, you know, we're looking at a quarter century ago. So for me, um, well, as people know, my memory's not as good as it used to be. But for me to even try to remember some of the names of the stores of the people who, who ran them, it's, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd have to sit down and think for a hard, long, hard time to to uh, remember any of this stuff. Don't worry, we're not going to put you on the spot to recount all of Westchester's comic shop history. You know, I really want to focus on, on Heroes World, mm -hmm. um, but before we get to that, just going back to Alternate Reality's location for a second, um, you picked very well, my friend. It was a great spot, and, uh, you know, again, obviously located on, on Central Avenue in Scarsdale, a uh, major artery, plenty of free parking, which, you know, I've, I've been to stores that, you know, don't have that, and it, it makes a difference. I think that really played into what we've been talking about over all of these years of the, the community, the fact that people could come and park and hang out all day. But speaking of that location, you know, since the store closed, that, that spot, 700 Central Park Avenue, had been vacant. And uh, I think it's now only, only a matter of time. There's a, an, an after-school learning center that's moving in there. And the last time I drove by, uh, there was some signage up, I think, on the window, not, not above yet. Um, but so sooner rather than later, that space will no longer be vacant. I mean, that's okay. It's been four years. I think the landlord was punished enough. Well, it's a new landlord now. Yeah, I know. But, uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I know. Well, the landlord, of course, was, was, a, was a whole other issue. But it's, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of us have said for a long time that there was something kind of fitting about the fact that, like, nothing could take its place, literally. But for the other tenants there and, and you know, just the area as a whole, I think it's, it's definitely good. And, you know, the running joke has been, you know, it's going to be an after-school learning center. I haven't confirmed this. Someone said it's a Japanese after-school learning center. Yes, it is. 
it always was <laughs> in its own way it always was i think there's kind of there's something uh very fitting about that yeah i should have charged tuition okay you yeah <laughs> um so all right let's begin our discussion of westchester's comic shop history and we begin at the at the start with heroes world for me that was the beginning i got my first comic book at heroes world and i know i know you know the story I know a lot of people here listening probably know the story. Like, I've told it a lot. I've talked about it on the podcast and in interviews that I've done and things like that. But I love telling the story because I feel like, and maybe you feel the same, maybe you feel differently. You know, you don't always have those specific moments in your life that you can pinpoint with 100% accuracy that that was a turning point. That was an inciting incident that set you on a, on a course. And for me, that moment in front of Heroes World is that type of moment. Were it not for that, you and I probably are not sitting here right now doing this. So, you know, for me, it was uh, winter of 92, around the holidays. Uh, I lived in Hartsdale, only child. I know you're an only child as well. Maybe we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, but I was with my parents. Uh, so again, lived in Hartsdale. Uh, I was with my parents at the Galleria Mall in White Plains, which is one town over from Hartsdale. And we came upon Heroes World. And, you know, I could check with them. Maybe they remember. I don't remember specifically if you know, they brought me up to the store or if we happened to be walking by and it caught my eye and I stopped us, I don't know. But I do remember, I was five years old. So the memory is, you know, I don't remember everything, but I, I specifically remember this moment of being in front of Heroes World, that window display. They were advertising the death of Superman and they had that Superman action figure in that miniature coffin. And it, it caught my interest. And my parents brought me in. They bought me uh, not the single issue comic, but the trade paperback of the Death of Superman storyline, which back in the day, trades did not come out. It was never a guarantee that things were going to get collected, and they certainly didn't come out that quickly. But DC pumped that trade out right away, it's like as soon as the storyline was done. This is 92? Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, so they, we went in, they bought me the, the trade paperback collection of, of the Death of Superman. I mean, winter, I mean, it could, 92, 93, but that winter. Uh, and they bought me the, the trade paperback. And, you know, that evening, I remember sitting in my parents' room on the recliner with my dad, and he, he read it to me. He read me that, that first comic book story. And I was hooked. It made me a, a comics fan. It made me a Superman fan. I think everything that's kind of flowed since then really started at that moment. And, you know, I think about that a lot. I think about the fact that, you know, we've talked in previous seasons about how our first impressions of certain characters are so formative, right? I don't think it's a shock. You know, my favorite character is Superman. That was the first story I read. But even on a, on a store level, the fact that the first place I got comics was a comic book specialty shop. You know, I talked to a lot of people, and I know this is a similar experience for you, and I, I want to get into this. You know, there was a time before there were comic shops. A lot of people got into it by finding, you know, comics on a rack at a, at a deli store or a grocery or something like that. So, you know, my first comic experience was at a comic shop, and that shop in particular, and it was incredibly formative. I wish I had more memories about Heroes World. Uh, the few that I have, you know, I, I can share as, as we go along here. But that was where it started for me. So it there was no other place to really start this season than than with Heroes World. Hmm. Okay. Do you remember what it looked like, the interior? Kind of. I mean, that's actually one of the things that I wanted to ask you uh, is sort of, you know, to describe the place. And I know, I understand that there was an original location in the Galleria. And I, I think the one that I went to is actually the, the second location they moved. It was just like across the across the way. Correct. Yeah, that boy, you're really going back a ways. Yeah. I barely remember the first location, but the, the second one is all on the third floor of the Galleria. Mm -hmm. um, the second one was where I really started to hang out a little bit more and got to meet Kevin, who was the manager there. Um, let's see. Uh, I don't know if you remember, they had... Uh, it wasn't well decorated. They used this piping, red pipes, that were connected to each other, and you could attach uh, um, bins to them and shelves to them. Um, kind of dangerous, actually, because I remember uh, there was one incident where uh, I must have slipped somehow, and the pipe, which was an open hold pipe, maybe about the size of a quarter, um, actually jab, jammed into my thumb, and uh, f actually had a piece of skin that could you could peel back from my thumb, about the size of uh, a nickel, I guess. Bled a lot, had a scar for uh, a good twenty years. You know, it's it's gone now, but um, uh, I, I thought to myself, this is never going to go away. 
That's my well, that's, that's my memory of Hero Squirrel. <laughs> All right, that'll do it. Don't be a flat squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, I mean they had very simple bins where comics were old back issues were jammed into the the uh, I guess columns. Um, I don't mean to cut you off, but it's amazing to me. Again, I don't have the most specific memories, but I remember it as being, you know, so, so like cool and colorful and, and all of this. And the way you're describing it is like, so like humdrum. It was blue and red. I think, I think it was that. That I, was pretty much it. I mean, I remember those windows. I remember going in, I think to the right were, was, was the wall of, of comics, I want to say. And then like the register was in an island in the middle. Am I remembering this correct? They, they may have redesigned it because of the piping situation. You could do whatever you want. Hmm. Uh, the way I recall, you'd walk in and then the register would be on the right in sort of a little, not an alcove, but you, they, hmm. you know, the pipes are set up in such a way with the, with a countertop so that uh, you, were, you were in like a little cubicle and then overseeing everything in the middle. Hmm. Um, again, I think the comics, the new comics were shelved towards the back. Uh, which they always say to do that as far as a store, so that people, people have to walk through. The people store. walk through the store, and they might see other stuff along the way or on the way back out. Or you could be like our friend uh, Ralph at Alternate Reality Comics in Vegas. He doesn't even have a new wall. Everything's just mixed throughout the store. You got to walk through everything to find what you want. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. He's not yeah. messing around. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, it's great, I guess, for the people who have time to to hang out. But you know, we found that a lot of people just have to rush in, get their books, and then get out of there. So make it simple we actually made it a little more difficult because we mixed the new stuff in with the old stuff stuff that was two three months ago at ar you mean yeah yeah so uh, but we but had, had the, the new tags we had the new tags so you can identify it but i mean a lot of shops would say oh let's put all the spider-mans here and all the x-men here so that you just go that one section you never even see that there's a new batman book out because you just go straight to spider-man i remember this was early days of me working at alternate realities i was so i was so pleased with myself uh the first issue of superman batman by jeff loeb came out and they had two covers. One cover featured Batman very prominently. The other co uh, cover featured Superman very prominently. And I had the idea, because the title technically was Superman, Batman. So we would have been perfectly justified just putting it in the Superman section. But my bright idea was we put the Batman covers under B for Batman and on the Superman covers with the Superman books. I think it worked out pretty well. Well, that works out fine. I mean, it's, you know, for, I guess it, it, everything has pros and cons. I mean, when uh, Winter Soldier came out, um, it's a Captain America title or an offshoot of Captain America, but you don't put it with C's. You should put it with C's with Captain America uh, and the other books, but, uh, we had to split it up to be next to Captain America as well as under W for Winter Soldier. And when you have so many books and so many titles coming out every week, you only have so much self shelf space. So uh, as a, as a storekeeper, I was annoyed that, uh, Marvel had done something in a way that they got more shelf space. Right. And, and basically booted out somebody else that, that uh, there's no room for. Hmm. So, you know, we'll circle back. Right, right. To, we'll go back to no, Heroes no, no, World. No, 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 <laughs> we'll circle back to Heroes World. And I also want to talk about Heroes World generally, because we're talking about one specific location in White Plains. There was a lot more to Heroes World. We'll unpack that. But take me back, because I want to know a little bit more about your comic shop history, because it is also part of the Westchester comic shop history, the time before there were comic shops. You were born in 56, only child. I know the early years of your life, you lived in Riverdale with your parents. And then when you were about like seven or so, you moved to White Plains. Uh, second grade. So what was that? Yeah, that was seven, that? Or seven or eight. Seven years, yeah. Right. And so at what point, when do comic books enter the picture for you? When, well, that, when and where that, do you get your first that, comic? That was still back in Riverdale. Yeah. Um, this is at the time, again, no comic book shops. But uh, if you went down to the, the shoe store and bought a pair of shoes or sneakers... There were only two kinds at the time, Keds and uh, PF Flyers. But uh, you bought a pair of shoes, the guy at the, uh, the shoe salesman would give you a comic book. And um, usually it was uh, uh, the old Charlton books in the early, the, this is late 50s, early 60s. Um, they you know, usually consisted of stuff like fighting army, uh, fighting navy, fighting air force, uh, Timmy the Timid Ghost, stuff like that, stuff that you probably wouldn't collect today, mm -hmm. but uh, they're pretty classic. They're not, they weren't well done or anything like that, but it, they were cool because they're comic books. And so those are my first comics. Um, I guess when we moved to Westchester in White Plains, again, no comic book stores, but uh, you could go to a stationery store. The one we went to was in Rye called uh, Big Top. 
it's a chain of stationary stores. We had one in Hartsdale, and I oh, remember yeah. it very fondly, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, th- there are a typical newsstand with Hallmark cards and all this other stuff, but uh, we would go there because of the supermarket there in that shopping center. Um, I would always go in. Uh, they'd have two racks of comic books kind of just stuffed on uh, not even four feet. But you had, you know, and, and again, they had no choice of what they got. This is the old newsstand distribution system. So you would go in and you'd find Daredevil 7 and you buy it for 12 cents. And then a month later you'd go in and you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily get Daredevil 8 because... Right, very random. Yeah, you, know, you were lucky to find a Daredevil 9 the next time. For know? a kid with OCD, that must have been very trying. At the time, it wasn't so bad because I just enjoyed each one. And I poured over every book, every panel. That's why to this day, I don't need to look at Silver Age books. I, I, in my mind, I can still see each panel and the dialogue and everything. My Comic Shop History is brought to you in part by our friends at Fat Moose Comics in Whippany, New Jersey. And what do you know? I happen to have Fat Moose clerk Sean Hendricks right here. Welcome, Sean. Hello. Good to be here. Sean, what's the motto at Fat Moose Comics? And you can't say friendship and fun. That's already taken. Oh, man. A motto? You know, I haven't given this much thought at all. Oh, I got it. Ready. Fat Moose Comics. Come for the comics. Stay for the cocktails. There you go. (laughs) Thanks to Fat Moose for their support. One of our podcast sponsors is a family of film festivals. The Brightside Tavern Film Festival in Jersey City, the Point Lookout Film Festival on Long Island, and the Hang On To Your Shorts Film Festival in Asbury Park. Find them all on Film Freeway, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for information about dates, tickets, and film submissions. The Brightside Tavern Film Festival takes place the first weekend of August. Filmmakers, don't be a flat squirrel. Submit your films and scripts via Film Freeway with discount code SJRBright2019. June 25th is the final deadline. Also, be sure to visit iTunes or a shareduniverse.com to tune into the official Hang On To Your Shorts podcast. And I guess that went on for, I don't know how many years. Oh, I know. I stopped when they went from 15, they, they jumped from 12 cents to 15 cents. And then uh, when they went from 15 to, I think, 20 cents, then I said, that's outrageous. I'm not paying 20 cents for a comic book. So and you had a period where you, you, you yeah, stopped. Yeah, I, I, went, I, I went cold turkey, and I didn't miss it that much. And this was, were you in high school yet? I think, um, I guess I must have been in high school, because um, when I got to college, which was fall of 78. Yale? Yale. I um, wandered, the first week I was wandering around, I came across a newsstand, um, they had some comic books. I think they were 25 cents. And so I bought a handful and read them and I got hooked again. Then I had to go back to find all those 20 centers that I refused to buy. But now I was going to pay 30 cents for them because there were back issues. And where were you finding these? At this point, were there comic specialty shops that were um, back issues? There probably were, but in New Haven, there weren't any. So the only place I could find was a, a little secondhand bookstore mm-hmm. called The Paperback Trader. And uh, she had like, um, the woman had... Oh, I don't know, maybe a table with a, you know, maybe a box or two of old comic books. So I used to, I used to go there, I guess, after classes on a Friday or something and then uh, pick up a couple. You know, it's actually funny that, you know, you mention uh, falling away from comics because, again, I've, I've really been racking my brain trying to work out the sequence uh, of my own comic shop history. And I, you know, again, I got into comics with The Death of Superman and I want to say I read Superman regularly you know, that was 92 into 93, probably into 94. But then I had a period, I don't know if it was a full year, it might have been where I kind of lost interest and I wasn't going and and reading anymore. And then oddly enough, so I did kind of have my own newsstand experience because I remember, and I was probably like late 95, maybe early 96 at this point. uh, But I had a, a Christmas concert at school, the elementary school I attended, Sacred Heart in Hartsdale. And on the four corners in Hartsdale, uh, there was a deli called Dairy Dell. It actually just, it had been Dairy Dell for a long time. And just recently they renamed it like Bagel Dell or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> but I remember uh, my mom wasn't there. I think she had like some work event or something. But I remember my dad was with me for that, that particular like, Christmas concert. And we stopped into Dairy Dell. He probably needed to get like cigarettes or something. And they had their newsstand, their wall of, of, of comics and other periodicals. And They had a Superman comic. It was from the Trial of Superman storyline that was going on in the books at the time. And the cover was uh, Superman on a Wanted poster. And that kind of got me back into it because I had fallen out of it a little bit. Uh, So I I had my own little newsstand experience and my own own time of kind of falling away a bit. 
if I'm not mistaken, was there was there an instance where you were you were sick when you were a kid and your mom brought you comics? Oh yeah, that one. I mean, this is still early or mid '60s, I guess it was. Yeah, I, I just I, I was home with a cold or a flu or something, and um, mom went to uh, into the city white plains to, I guess it was the pharmacy, and next door to the pharmacy was a little soda shop that had comics magazine shop that had uh, comics and so she brought home the Avengers 25 where they you know, the new Avengers which was Cap, Hawkeye, Scarlet Witch, Quicksilver taking on Doctor Doom um, and so she bought me that as a I guess a get well thing um, again like all the other comic books at the time I read it to the point where not that it fell apart but I, re- I read it thoroughly and again remember every panel right but that's nice that she did that I mean I'm curious what your parents stance on on the comics what that stance was generally do they support uh, your reading do they did they get it because i feel like my parents often did, didn't <laughs> uh, well um i don't think my mom didn't you know, i don't think my mother had much opinion many opinions about it but uh my father i don't think was too happy because i spent a lot of money as time wore on and um i guess i guess it wasn't until what uh, 20 no, 2008, 2009 or something like that. In that neighborhood when uh, I decided to get rid of everything. Right, you sold everything through Heritage. Through Heritage. And then when checks started rolling in every week, Dad did all the accounting for it. So, uh, you know, all of a sudden it's like, wow, all this junk that my son had been collecting for the past 30-odd, 40 years is, is turning out to be a great, inv- that turned out to be a great investment. Yeah. And, um, and so he, uh, that pleased him. You know, I still think, uh, I mean, again, there was that incident about the Batman one where I think I'm, I think I've told this story before. I had the opportunity to buy one for $35,000. Oh, right. Yep. And, um, you know, at that time I, I could, but, uh, I knew that if I spent as much on a single comic book as my parents had spent on the house back in 63 when they bought the house, um, and they had scraped and really the mortgage payments for years. And, you know, they, they struggled to, to make the mortgage payments. And for, for me to throw $35,000 onto a comic book, it would have, my father would totally not understood it. Hmm. Um, you know, it would have, after, well, he passed away, but it would have turned out to be a, a million dollar investment. But at the same time, I would have lost his respect before he died. Hmm. And you know what? In the in the in the long in the in the the bottom line is it's not worth it. You know, better that uh, he didn't look at me sideways and think what what, what an odd kid I raised. Hmm. So uh, no, I I understand. I mean, that's a you know yeah. nice sentiment to you know kind of want to be seen yeah. a certain way by your father. Um, yeah, I mean, I've talked about this before that, uh, you know, my mother in particular was not a huge fan of me reading comics, especially as a kid. Her fear was that it was going to impact my schoolwork. Hmm. That being said, because I know I tell that story a lot, (laughs) but in her defense, you know, it wasn't her favorite thing in the world that I read them. I don't know that my dad really had much of an opinion. Again, like he read that first one to me. Uh, beyond that, I, again, I don't know that, uh, he really had much of a stance one way or the other, but uh, again, my mom didn't love it. But despite that, and people, you know, this is, you'll probably hear me say this a lot over the course of these episodes. Like, my mom brought me to all of these stores. I mean, again, I was a little kid going around West. I wasn't riding my bike. Like, I was a little kid. And, uh, you know, she was taking me to, to Hero's World and to Dragon's Den and to One of My Cards and to Alternate Reality. Like, she took me to all these places, even though she didn't love the fact that I was reading comics. And, you know, I, I look back, I, I mean, I cherish those moments. Like, we had, I had our little routine. Uh, like, when we went to uh, the Galleria for Hero's World, we would go downstairs there was a food court area, but nearby there was a, uh, I guess it was a Barnes and Noble, it was a bookstore, and across from there there was a, like a coffee shop or something. Bo- Borders Books. Was it Borders at the time? Yeah, I think so. Again, it's been a while, so that's why I'm glad you're here. Yeah. Um, but there was the bookstore. Occasionally we would go in there, but right across the way there was this little, you know, like coffee shop stand or whatever, and uh, you know she would get coffee and we get like a chocolate muffin, and <laughs> we'd usually split it. I'd have a sip of coffee, I think. I was a little kid, but I, I remember <laughs> trying it at least. Um, but that was like a little routine that we had. And so, you know, I always look back and again, even though it wasn't her favorite thing, you know, she made sure I got my comics. I do appreciate that, mm-hmm. you know, and just as your mom brought you, you know, yours and your dad, even though he maybe didn't think it was the the greatest use of time or money, you know, the fact that he, at least it didn't, you know, forbid you from, <laughs> from reading. Uh, yeah, at least like he that. didn't throw it all away. Yeah, yeah that's it. I know that's, that's true too. Yeah. 
Um, so, you know, again, elementary school, fell out of it in high school, got back into it in college. At this point, you know, you're getting your comics, newsstands, you're starting to fill in gaps in your collection uh, through conventions. I know, uh, you know, after Yale, you went to law school uh, yeah, up, up in, in Albany. And I know there was Albany. that store, Fanico, that opened as soon as you, you got up there, right? The first week we were there, walking around, I saw some flyers that they're going to open a new store next week. A and comic like, book? So is that com- that was, was your was, first was comic, comic book shop? Um you know, now that I think about it, I guess Fanico in Albany was my first regular shop because I would go there every Friday afternoon when comic books were released. And but then, as far as Westchester specifically, was Heroes World the first Westchester shop that you came upon? I think it probably was. Um, it was simple enough to go. There. Well, again, the gallery at the time was the hangout. So, all right. So now this brings us to Heroes World. Before we talk about. Because I want to really get into your experience as as a customer and and briefly a worker there, but let's talk about Heroes World generally. Because again, there's this larger picture to Heroes World, which again, as a kid, no idea. And it's only recently that I've like really researched it and, and learned a lot more about it. But as a kid, it was just oh, that's the comic shop and the gallery. I didn't know that there was so much more to it. That it was a chain of stores and a distributor as well. Well, I think there were I think there were five or six, maybe even more stores. There were about a dozen. So were there a dozen? I, so, uh, they were all along the uh, east northeast coast. Right. So this started. Uh, Ivan Snyder mm-hmm. was the person who who got all of this started. He worked at Marvel in the seventies in their sales and licensing division. He ran their uh, mail order service, so they would sell products featuring their characters through the mail and, and he ran this piece of the of the business um, in 75 Marvel uh, decided they didn't want this mail order service anymore he as I understand it purchased it from them and ran it himself uh, as a company called superhero enterprises originally out of his basement yeah you see advertisements for that in comic books oh okay yeah they were uh, the mail away things so he ran it uh, originally out of his basement, and then he uh, had a storefront in Morristown, and then he added another location in a mall, and then, again, so it, it grew, and then uh, eventually there was a, a legal issue with respect to the use of uh, super, the word superhero, so he ended up changing the name to Heroes World, and by the early 80s, uh, again, there were about a dozen uh, locations, again, in this geographic area, uh, most of them in malls, uh, as I understand it, uh, and... So that's the retail side of it. And then, of course, Heroes World was also this regional distributor as well. So not a national one like Diamond or Capital City Comics, um, but they served, uh, you know, this area. So there was this whole other piece to Heroes World that, again, as a kid, I had no idea. Well, there were a lot of different distributors uh, way back when. Right. Um, yeah, people the, nowadays, of course, you know, if you know the distributors, you know, you know Diamond and that's it. Diamond's there was it so much because more. they have the exclusives. But uh, Capital City was a big one. They were based out in uh, the Midwest, and um, even on Staten Island, uh, there was a there was this tribute. What is it called? Comics Unlimited, I think. Mm. Uh, Walter Wang was the guy who ran that. Um, so Heroes World, you know, was just a piece of of the whole puzzle of distribution. You know, that's sort of a little bit of the background on on Heroes World and on these again the retail and the distribution side of it. But I mean, do you remember first? Do you remember the moment that you discovered Heroes World? Like, did you stumble upon it in the mall? Did you know that it was going to be opening? Like, had you seen an ad or anything for it that no, you knew I, it was going to be there? I don't recall any of that. No. Yeah, I mean, to me, it was, uh, you walk in, it's like, ooh, comic books. And uh, you start collecting stuff, and you start talking to the guy who works there. And, um... But yeah, I feel like it was something you would be excited about, no? Well, sorry. <laughs> that's <laughs> all right. I mean... If you're not, you know, I mean, if you weren't, like, that's fine. Well, I mean, you know, it's like, I guess I've walked into so many comic book stores over the past five, six decades that it doesn't really... Yeah, but at the time you <laughs> hadn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I guess, at the time it was kind of a new thing, and especially for the area, no? Well, again, you know, my comic book store had been Fanico, really. And uh, now that I was back in White Plains, I wasn't going to drive up three hours to Albany every week to book up, pick up books. Um, and so, you know, that became the place for me to, to, to buy my books. And I don't think I even had a reserve or they had reserves. I don't remember, but, uh, but I was close enough because I lived in White Plains. I was close enough to go there as, as often as I wanted to. And when, I guess at that point, I don't remember when books came in, maybe they were Wednesday nights that came in for Thursday release, but, uh, you know, I could be there Wednesday night and, and pick up the books before, well, they're still fresh. Like like picking fruit, you know, they just uh, you know, right off the tree, but um, but that was just sort of the routine that we fell into, and you know that's how I met Kevin, and uh, 
So this was yeah. post law school. You were working as a consultant for a moving and storage company. At that time, I don't think I was. I think I was unemployed for a while, oh. and um, just to have something to do part time. And because he always needed to hire help, there's a girl named Nicole who was beautiful. I mean, she she was beautiful like like Brooke Shields beautiful, you know, young Brooke Shields, and uh, very smart. She actually I think went to Princeton in the end, but uh, you know, he didn't know anything about comic books. I mean, he tended to hire, so there was one guy, he was, I think he was Hispanic and, and had, you know, shaved his head and all that. He used to wear a cap or a hat all the time. But, uh, you know, he was a little on the older side. And I remember walking in one evening and, you know, the mall was kind of quiet. Um, walking in one evening and his head is on the counter and he's fast asleep. <laughs> there you go. Because <laughs> he was drunk. <laughs> that was... Uh, not that it happened a lot, but you know stuff like that is uh, uh, things I kind of remember about the about about Heroes World. Um, I think everybody knows the story about that Fantastic Four number one that they had on uh, display. And again, this is before the price of these you know key back issues were, were astronomical. This is uh, what was it about? It was like a five hundred dollar copy. It wasn't even a great copy, but that was about the price of, of the book at the time. And they had that on display behind the counter. And again, it's one of the high school girls that were working there who didn't know comic books. And as I recall, some kid came in and asked, how much is that? And the girl looks at it. And because of the, the, the fluorescent lighting, I don't know, if, again, the, mm. the, the, you might remember that, you know, it, the price tag had kind of faded because of the lighting. And uh, she looks at it and goes, $5. <laughs> it's <was> 500 <laughs> So So the kid goes, okay. And he bought it for 5 bucks. <laughs> Wow. What are you going to do, you know? Uh, let's, we, we should mention, though, you know, you know, perhaps the young ladies who work there weren't as well-versed, but that's not to say that uh, young women shouldn't be working at stores oh, no. generally. <laughs> we don't want to generalize. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. It's just that. Just you know, in those specific yeah, instances. That, that, there, there was a, there was this. Because I remember even as a customer, I would go in there, and you know how, again, it's the, partially the OCD, but as a collector, you wanna, you're buying the nicest copy you can find. And even when it comes right out of the printer and right out of the distributor's cases, a lot of those things have, have spine breaks and curls and all kinds of problems and folds. So, uh, you know, you, you go through the trouble of picking all the books out and you take your little pile of books. And, well, not little pile, but let's say it's about, uh, oh, two dozen books. And you put it on the counter for the girl to ring up. But she doesn't know that there's any value to a, a mint copy as opposed to a VG copy, a very good copy. So she's so rough when she's going through that to, to ring it into the register. And uh, that used to drive me crazy. Okay, so I think that's a good segue here. At this point, uh, I want to play for listeners a few minutes of my conversation with Kevin Halstead, uh, one of the Alternate Realities co-founders and a former manager of Heroes World. This was a first in the history of this podcast. I did a remote recording. Kevin's out in Seattle. He's been there for a couple of decades now. So I've never met him in person. Uh, I think, you know, if people have been following the show for a while, you know, we always do these episodes face to face. I love having the face to face conversation. I think it, it really, uh, it, it's a great environment for really, uh, you know, engaging conversation. That being said, I wanted to make sure that I included Kevin. I've wanted to talk to him for a long time. So uh, we spoke for about an hour over the phone and I recorded it. And uh, I want to play now a, a few minutes where he speaks about uh, how you came to work at Heroes World. So here we go. This is something that I only learned recently within the past couple of years, I guess, that Odo worked at Heroes World uh, prior yep. to, to founding Alternate Realities. And I'm fascinated by this. Uh, so, so how did how did this come to be? Well, Steve was a customer at Heroes World. He was a a subscriber. He had a, a pull box. Um, at first, I remember him as being you know, he was the guy that we used to have to hold the books extra long when he went to his annual trip to Japan. I remember you know we used to have to hold him for a few weeks. But he was always in, uh, usually every, every Thursday night when the books came in, he'd come in and, and pick them up on his way home from work. And then eventually over the course of time we were talking, and I think he had some kind of an issue with how the subscriber books were being pulled. So he offered to work just the night of the shipments 
to do the pull the subscriber books, pull and file the subscriber books. And eventually, I think he pretty much just stayed to that one day, and I think maybe he put in a few more days a week here and there. Um, maybe he was working some weekends, too. I don't recall him working there that long. Uh, you know, I don't even know if it was a full year, but that's that's how it started, is just to pull the subscriber book. <laughs> I'm not surprised that he had... <laughs> <laughs> he had something to say about how the books were being pulled. Although it's funny, I mean, then he, I guess everything comes around because as a retailer himself, he dealt with a lot of people who were very particular about how their books were handled. You know, we've told the story on the podcast before. There were customers who literally wouldn't let us touch their books uh, right. when, when they oh, brought right. them up. I my fair share of them too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, but so, so now at this point when he's working at the store, I'm assuming this is like late 80s, early 90s, like shortly before AR? Uh, I think it was probably closer to early to mid 80s. I don't recall, I, like, meeting Steve for the first time. I think he'd already maybe been shopping there. Um, but I think it was early in the time that I was there. Because at that point, I don't think I was manager of that store yet. Uh, so it was probably early 80s, I would say. Okay. Uh, and what was he like? What was he like as a as a worker? Because again, you know, keep in mind, I only dealt with him in the context of he owns his store. And yes, there were right. times where there were other owners, and you know, he had to sort of navigate that. But you know, ultimately, he you know was always a, uh, in a position of authority. What was he like? Uh, I guess taking direction from others. <laughs> oh, he was he was fine. Um, you know, it was if if it was mostly new comic day. It was kind of crazy, so I didn't really, you know, interact too much, I don't recall. Young Steve. Amazing. So that was a few minutes of my conversation with Kevin Halstead. Um, if you want to hear the entire conversation, that is going to be this season's Patreon-exclusive bonus episode of My Comic Shop History, and it will be available one week from today on Wednesday, June 19th. So you can hear the entire episode uh, by signing up. You'll get access to that episode and a ton more uh, of exclusive podcast episodes. So in that little excerpt, he talked about how uh, you came to work there and building off of what you were just saying. <laughs> apparently, yeah, you had an, you were a subscriber, as he, as he describes it, mm. and you had an issue with the way uh, they were handling the books. I mean, I don't know if it was specifically when you would bring them up to get rung up or if you had an issue with the way they were actually pulling the books, the way they were storing them, maybe. Do you remember any of this? All I remember is that young girl really mishandling the books as she's ringing it up and i'm looking at her saying can you be a little careful on those books and she's looking at me like i'm nuts um i think as far as the uh when the shipments arrived late at night and you'd have uh again you'd have a crowd of people in front of the store and this is late in the evening because sometimes that the the truck from heroes world the, the main headquarters took forever to get to the to the galleria um, or they'd be delayed at one of the other stores or something. So finally, by the time they finally got to us, it was it was late enough that you have all these people pushing like a um, like people trying to get theater tickets or something or mm. concert tickets. It was it was it was a, a little mob outside. And I remember, uh, you know, Kevin, we would get these boxes. We'd open up. We wouldn't even count them. We had to assume that the count was right. But uh, <laughs> Kevin would hold up a comic book in front of the crowd and tell people back up or I'm going to rip this in half. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like that scene in Blazing Saddles, you know, it's like putting a gun to it. Um, and, and they would all back up for, you know, a little bit before they start moseying in a little bit more. But, um, but I would think that because of the, the, not panic, how can I say it? The rush to get the books onto the shelves because of these crowds, I think they're probably handled roughly. You know, the store wasn't crazy about it. Not like we were at AR to try to get the best and, and call in every damage when a bunk corner or whatever. So, you know, we talked about how, as you describe it, I guess, it wasn't the biggest deal in the world to come across Heroes World, despite the fact that <laughs> there weren't a lot of specialty shops in the area. But whatever, it was a place you went, you got your comics. Uh, you didn't like the way that they that they handle the books necessarily. But then 
when you work there helping unload the new shipment, you had the opportunity to get your hands on the books first, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Again, it was surprising to me. I guess I just, you know, again, I've, I've only known you in the context of being either the owner or one of the owners of Alternate Realities. I can't quite imagine you working like for another store. What, ki- what kind of worker do you recall yourself being? Um, it's, it's not, not so much a recollection, but uh, I would imagine that if, if I'm just a drone, I just did what I was told to do and just made sure it was done properly. And that, that's, uh, you know, I guess the, the advantage of being just the worker is that you don't have to worry about other things. Um, again, I think Kevin had more, of a pre- more pressure on him there because if the books didn't get there, if there's a problem... He was sure. the one who had to deal with it. Um, much like, you know, when, when we were at the store at yeah. AR, it's like, you know, if there's no toilet paper, somebody's got to run out and buy it, and it's usually me. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess... Uh, I mean, did you like it? Like, looking back on it, as best you can recall, was it something where you're like, oh, well, like, this is cool, like, I'm working in a shop, or you're like, whatever, I just want to be able to get my books the way I want them, and it's a oh, means no, to no. end. No, I don't, think, I don't think it was so much of the... Uh, but it was nice, be- again, because I, I wasn't working... And, you know, you get a paycheck. And they took out the FICA and all that kind of stuff. Oh, but they were you get, official. You, yeah, I mean, it, it, was a, it was real work. I mean, it, you'd, uh, you know, it's nice to have a little paycheck just to pay for some, some necessities once in a while. But, uh, but again, I, I, I didn't think this is going to be what I was going to do. You know, it was a question of finding something else. And little think, did you know. Yeah. But I guess because, because of the experience of working other things kind of taught me that I really hate everything else. <laughs> but like at the time that you were, and so like, were you ringing up customers or any of that? Or you were really yeah. just, oh, you did all that too? Well, you know, I think everybody did. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, it was like you guys when you worked at AR. Sure. You know, it's, um, uh, it, uh, well, hell's bells. I mean, the customers at AR are ringing up people. <laughs> you, <Yes. know? laughs> you know, it's like somebody's in the back. So it's like, okay, I'll just ring you up. <laughs> that's yeah. it. And that's how everybody ended up getting a wor- at work at the store, you know? But, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you learn how to do that. and um, What you is, were to those of us who worked at AR, who, who was that for you? I mean, Kevin, or was there anyone else who kind of uh, mentored you and shared, imparted wisdom? Well, no, I don't think there's anybody mentoring me so much. No. It's just that this is a, this is a job and these, these things had to get done. <laughs> I always love when we do these episodes. You know, I try to set you up for stuff. <laughs> you give me nothing. <laughs> uh, I, it's such a disappointment for you. I'm sorry, you know. It's a... But this is like, you know, it's like any other job you get. It's like, you know, you're hired to do this work, you do the work, and, and that's it. And I guess if I, if, if, if I had to become assistant manager or something like that, then maybe I'd, it would have been more, you know, more responsibility to make sure things were done more efficiently or right. whatever. But as far as I was concerned, it was like, you know, this is, you just got to open the store, you got to ring up people, you know, maybe straighten out a little bit. But... Um, but again, remember, Heroes World was a very small store. Uh, again, as as a young, you know, child, it might have looked humongous to you. But uh, I guess I, I would say it's maybe the size of your living room. <laughs> no, it had to have been bigger than that. We don't have that big of a living room. But you know, so going back to what I remember, or what little I remember of the store, um, you know, when I think back of specific memories, it's really, I mean, it's less than a handful. I remember, I remember two of the guys who work there, Raúl and Pierre. Do you remember those I, guys? Boy, those are names I hadn't thought about. Raul was the guy who fell asleep on the. <laughs> oh, that was the guy. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> and Pierre was a, a skinny black guy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember the names. I very, I remember very little about each individual. You know, it's interesting because in, in researching this, you know, uh, to kind of pull back the, the curtain a little bit, the original plan for the season, uh, the original original plan was like the entire thing to be heroes world centric because again there was the distribution side the retail side the different stores um but it was hard finding and tracking down these people uh so ultimately though it worked out for the best because i think taking a wider view on westchester as a whole uh, or at least you know not the entire county but the, the shops that played a role in my story uh i think that was the better way to go but uh but yeah because like those are two guys like i don't have any means of getting in touch with them but it'd be interesting to talk to them I remember one, if not both of them, always in a shirt and tie. Uh, uh, maybe, was his name Pierre? Maybe, yeah. 
Maybe he was. I remember one of them giving me a free Superman comic once. Uh-huh. And I was like, ooh, I got a free comic. Uh-huh. And then, I rem- again, not, not a ton of specific memories, but I remember the... Do you remember the Final Night miniseries that DC put out? And it was a, like, it tied into all the books at the time. Well, I mean, I remember it because I look at it as back issues when I'm doing inventory. Right. But, uh... So, uh, but, you know, the sun goes out, Superman loses his powers. It's oh, okay. a whole, you know, it's a whole yeah. thing. The fate of the, of the world is at stake. Um, but it was a weekly uh, four issue miniseries. Again, it tied into all the DC books that month. So at this point, you know, I had like they pulled the Superman books for me. I remember that at least. But Final Night was a separate thing. But I got it because it was actually done by uh, one of the, the creative teams from one of the regular Superman books at the time. And obviously Superman was in it, so I, I wanted to get it. But it wasn't on my on my list. And I remember going in and they had sold out. And again, I don't know, I was six, seven at this point. And I just remember they said, oh, we don't have it. And I just like turned around and like stormed out of the store. <laughs> and I remember my mom following me. She's like, you can't do that. Like, that was rude. But uh, I remember that. I remember that. Oh, good and, memories, good memories. And, you know, them in the shirt and tie and getting the free comic. And the last, unfortunately, the last memory and it's i guess as vivid to me as that first moment outside of the store was when i went there that one day and it was gone oh okay i don't remember the closing so, i must i must have at that point already moved up yeah i, did. I must have already moved up to chapel Qual. i mean at that point uh you know alternate realities was already around oh, was heroes world still around when we were no i don't think so yeah because I went, I, that, that kind of the closing of Heroes World led me to AR. I had been there maybe once or twice before to pick up something that uh, Heroes World didn't have. And then once Heroes World was gone, then AR became, you know, kind of like the place or one of the main places for me. So Kevin left Heroes World because Kevin was working at Borders Books downstairs in the Galleria. Right. When we opened AR. Yeah. So, he, so, a, so Heroes World was still in yeah. business at the time? I believe. So... I mean, again, the, you know, if, hmm. if our timing is a little off, it's, it's not the end of the world here. But, you know, again, kind of stepping back and taking a look at what was going on with Heroes World beyond just this one location that we've been talking about. In 94, uh, Marvel bought Heroes World and made Heroes World its sole distributor. Yeah. And this led to a lot of issues within the industry. Um, I mean, certainly from a retailer perspective, you know, you had to go through Heroes World now to get at least your Marvel book. So what ended up happening, as I understand it, you know, you have retailers who now have to maintain multiple accounts with multiple distributors, uh, which, of course, uh, logistically speaking, is more of a hassle. You have multiple order forms, uh, payment systems, all of that, uh, multiple shipments to break down. And then on top of it, since you're... uh, spending less with each distributor you know your the discount you get is tied to how much you're you're buying so your discount is going down with each one and it, it that led to a lot of issues and on top of that uh you know heroes world again had been this regional player they didn't really have you know the the operation to handle distribution on a nationwide scale and there were late shipments and they're worldwide scale right it was worldwide scale yeah because it was just a little guy suddenly you have to play with the big boys. And then so by 97, Heroes World went out of business. Now, mm-hmm. I don't know. So obviously by 97, that Galleria location was gone. I don't know if it closed in that year or a little bit before. But I remember <laughs> walking through those doors with my mom into that that floor and just seeing the empty store. And again, you know, we had been there, I think, two weeks before. I think I was kind of averaging like in every other week at that point. Uh, and, you know, there were no signs. They didn't say anything. And, you know, two weeks later we went and it was gone. And again, there was... Was it, was it an empty space? They, completely they moved empty. everything out? Everything was gone. Wow, that was quick then. And I remember we, there was like a shoe store, I, I want to say, right next door to it. And we went in. The initial thought was like, oh, maybe they moved somewhere else in the mall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was like the hope. And we asked them and, you know, they didn't have a ton of information either. But it was just like, no, like they closed. And that was it. And it was, I mean... You know, in the grand scheme of things, like there's a lot that's way worse than that. So I don't want to be overly dramatic, like, oh, it was traumatic. But, you know, as certainly in this comic shop sphere, it was. I mean, it was, you know, that was part of that was my routine. And I like the store a lot. And it's where I got into comics and, and to go and, and it was gone. Uh, it was tough. But it led me to AR. So I guess it's all for the best. I guess. It's, it's interesting. The perspectives are, are, are interesting because from my point of view, comic shops come and go so uh but see as a i didn't have like yeah, i yeah. didn't know that at the time i mean yes obviously rationally that makes sense <laughs> but as a little kid it's like 
you know, I was I was in the mall and one day the store was there and then one day it was gone. Mm. Like, you know, it's not like something that I had I had lived through with with other shops. Yeah, I guess I guess I've seen. So and I was much. still a little kid. <laughs> okay, okay. I guess again I've seen so many different businesses close from like little food stores or delis or all kinds of stuff. I mean, again, I guess you know after what twenty three years next in in the in our mall in our shopping plaza, there were like seven delis next door to us. Right. <laughs> So I was like, okay, they're here one day, gone the next. Yeah, but I mean, you, I mean, you know firsthand how much you know these these comic shops can mean to people. I mean, when AR was closing, all the people who came in and talked about how much it meant, they at least had an opportunity to say goodbye. I think that's the other aspect of this that was, you know, uh, again, for for lack of a better word, traumatizing as a kid was that it was just gone. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, if they had said like, hey, we're going to be, <laughs> we won't be here in a couple of weeks, you know, at least you can process it a little bit. But it was just kind of like having, you know, the, the, the rug pulled out from under you. Um, but so, again, that was, you know, we, we were all, I guess I'll estimate and say 96, 97. Um, by that point, obviously, Alternate Realities was up and running. So, you know, you had worked there at Heroes World, uh, you know, in the 80s for a period of time. Um, and then, of course, you'd go on to work at the law firm. And then I know they, you know, they were downsizing. They were letting associates go. As you've described in the past, you and Kevin and Gene had been talking about opening your own store, but your idea was that you'd still be practicing law. You'd be more, uh, you know, financial backing mm-hmm. and not running the day-to-day of the store. And then when the law job went away, you became hands-on. Yeah. So yeah. this is, yeah, this is 90, end of 91, early 92 when we started right. planning to this. Because, um, yeah, I mean, I do recall now driving down to long island city where heroes world had their warehouse i have to go down yeah early morning i would get up like four or five o'clock in the morning drive down to long island city got to beat the traffic to the manhattan get across long island city pick up the stuff then drive to uh i guess diamonds warehouse in brooklyn pick up their stuff and maybe capital city which is also on long island and pick up their stuff because we had what was it i guess um again when when marvel bought heroes world and became the exclusive marvel distributor um diamond was very quick on the take and, and contacted dc immediately and dark horse and image and got exclusive to become their them. exclusive distributor so suddenly capital city was left with egg on their face and they were getting like whiz not no whiz viz and uh fanographics and the small publishers so you kind of didn't have to go to, uh, well, I mean, even with the, with those guys, I guess you did have to go to, to get some of those. But for the real small press, it's like you could live without it. So I think it hurt a lot of uh, publishers. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, you know, since they weren't exclusive with, with uh, Diamond, they could still go through Diamond. But um, it came to the point where you want to try to help everybody. So we just bought Marvels from Heroes World and just about... Uh, just the DCs and the exclusives through Diamond and everybody else through Capital City. But Capital City was dying. I mean, was it, you know, kind of what I broke down in terms of, uh, you know, the, the issues and, and the complications that it would pose for a retailer? I mean, was that your experience? I mean, was it a hassle of having to deal with all those distributors? It was a lot of driving and a lot of uh, getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning to do it. Um, you know, I was younger, but I don't think I could do that today. But... Um, um, it was a, it was actually a good thing that uh, that Marvel that uh, Heroes World failed. I mean, was Heroes World as problematic as as I've been reading? I mean, in terms of uh, you know incorrect shipments or difficulty, you know, dealing with customer service. I mean, was it was it that problematic? Um, like, do you remember having a lot of issues with them? I didn't have a lot. No, actually, I didn't have a lot of issues with them. Uh, I think they had a I mean, let's, 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 like everybody else from their point of view. I think they they knew they had a a, a big job. And it was a lot of hassle, and uh, every week was was um, a big headache for them. Um, you know, you would get there, and then the next thing you know, you're standing there with all these other retailers waiting to pick up their stuff, and uh, they weren't ready for you. And then, um, yeah, I mean, like any distributor, they have their own problems that most retailers don't know about. They, they were very fair to us, though. I mean, uh, I don't know if it's because... Of Kevin's relationship with uh, Irene and Ivan, but there was a point where, again, in our early years, we were really falling behind in our payments. Right. And um, we owed 
so much because we couldn't pay our bills, but we, you know, they still supplied us with the books. And then after that first year, I contacted Heroes World and um, made some sort of payment plan hmm. so that I would pay the new bills and pay $200 towards old bills. And I guess, I don't remember how many months it took, but I remember, I specifically remember calling Mar uh, Heroes World or Marvel, I forget which one, but I, I, I called and I said, I just sent in the final payment of our, of our back bills. And <laughs> they said to me, oh, we know because you're the only, only the second store that's been able to get out of debt. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so it's like, oh, so they, again, you have to imagine they've got their problems. Yeah. And I'm, again, I'm just a drop in the bucket. You know, I mean, I was curious to get your take on, uh, you know, dealing with them as a distributor from the retailer perspective. So, you know, that was, of course, you know, when, when you had alternate realities. But I guess just kind of as we wind down here, you know, I'm curious when when you guys came together. And obviously, so you knew Kevin through uh, through Heroes World and Gene, you knew. Because I, I was shopping at his when I had moved up to Chappaqua. Okay, I, right. I was he had a store at his Comics Plus. In yeah, I was his regular reservists there so when you guys hatch this idea you know to open alternate realities and we you know we've talked about the opening of the store before so we don't need to re you know retread all of that but specifically in the context of heroes world i guess just a couple of quick questions i mean did you i mean did you was there any trepidation over like oh we're gonna like this might might be stepping on heroes world toes at all or was that not really a consideration was the kind was a sense like there's enough room for all of us oh i didn't think no i don't think that was ever a consideration um again there were a lot of other stores already um, right, Dragon's Den was already up and well, running. There was a, there was a Spider's Web in Port Chester. Oh, there was um, uh, every little town had one. Right, I yes, think going I, back I, to the map I, at the beginning. Yeah, I was. The, my, our only concern was that uh, we were so close to Dragon's Den hmm. that this might be a mistake. Um, actually, it wasn't. Yeah, I, I think it was. It was good to be close because people who didn't like Dragon's Den, we were the alternative. Were there, well, the other thing I was curious, are there, were there things from Heroes World uh, that you were like, that you wanted to emulate with alternate realities? Or on the flip of that, were there things that you were like, well, I think we could kind of approach this from a different way, maybe do it a little bit more effectively? Like how, if at all, did the experience of shopping and working at Heroes World influence your vision for AR? I don't think we ever discussed stuff like that. I guess if, uh, if somebody were to say it to me, if, if, if I were to go back in time and talk to my old self, my young self, I would say don't have that piping. And um, I think we kind of set it up the way we wanted to set it up. That's why we had those big back issue bins. And that's why we had the, uh, the slat wall and the, and the, uh, the L-shaped shelves for the new books. So, uh, you know, at, angled in such a way so that they won't fall forward. Um, and, you know, we flipped around. We, we'd made lots of changes as far as arrangements, you know, counter on this side or counter on that side. Right. So you guys, you know, you, you obviously then, you know, executed your own vision for the store. Um, uh, just with Heroes World though, uh, one other thing that I was curious about since it wasn't just a mom and pop shop, you know, there was this larger operation behind it. I mean, what sort of, cause again, I guess from a customer perspective and again, as a little kid, nothing necessarily registered with me, but uh, from your perspective, was there any sort of like corporate feel at the store? Was it, or did it feel more like, like loose and more like a mom and pop? The Heroes World organization? Yeah, or the, like the, oh, store, the store, the store in particular. The, the store was, no, I think the store was just kind of like, you know, here's the establishment that's open for the consumer. Um, I guess my, my feeling about Heroes World, the company was that it was a family run business. Mm. Um, I guess not just Ivan and Irene, but I think their son was involved in it. Uh, that's a whole different story. But, um, and that's why, you know, I kind of thought of uh, Here's World as a small mom and pop, uh, a family business. Interesting. Um, I mean, I guess, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I guess at the same time, it's like I think about, you know, the vast majority of stores I've, you know, explored and recorded with and all of that. It's usually like a single store and, and in some cases, literally like a mom and pop. Um, so just the fact that there was this, you know, the larger enterprise behind it, I guess, was a little bit different. Well, I think the only controversy that I ever thought about with Heroes World was that they're a distributor and they had their own retail outlets. And there was some sort of... Uh, conflict of interest. Conflict of interest there. Because, you know, as, as you know, when deliveries uh, are shorted by the publisher or the printer, um, 
and you're supposed to you know send out 50 copies to this store and 20 copies to that store whatever it is it, you got the feeling that that hard to get item always ended up at one of their shops interesting but you might get cut off in, mm-hmm. white, in, in, in you know far away white plains i don't know if it's true but something in the back of my mind is telling me that stuff like that would happen I mean, it certainly seems like at least there's a the potential for yeah, it. Yeah, and that's, so. but you know, so I, I, I recall a lot of stores weren't too happy about the fact that uh, Heroes World was a distributor and had their own shops. Um, anything, like, did you know Ivan and his wife personally? I'd met them. I didn't know them uh, that well. Any other, uh, you know, personalities at the store, either behind the counter or in front of the counter that, that really stood out to you? I mean, like, when we talk about AR, obviously there's this whole cast of characters. I mean, were there any people who, like, really made an impression? Customers? Um, or, or workers there. Anything that really stands out? No, I think, you know, I mentioned the workers that I recall. Like, and, again, we're talking about, what, 30 years ago was this? Um, you know, again, if you hadn't mentioned it, I would have remembered that guy's name. You know the, the the fellow who fell asleep drunk. Um, I just want to say, for the record, I asked you if you remembered stuff about Heroes World, and you said you did. You were like, I remember all this stuff. Well, I remember the stories, but I mean, as, as at the same time, I said, yeah, I, I don't know if I can tell all these kind of stories because it's like, eh, you'll edit it out, I suppose. But some of it, as as true as it might be, it's like I don't know if people want to stir up this kind of stuff because it's like anything. There's dirty laundry, right? Right, and. Um, it's, it's, you know, for the world to know about it, it's not going to change anything. And it's not going to make the world better for the people to know it. So it's like, eh, you know, it's, uh, it was one of those things that came and went. And a hundred years from now, nobody's going to care or remember. So I, I go with, with that. All right. Uh, well, anything else then about Heroes World generally that you want to share? Uh, and if not, that's fine. No, I mean, again, it, it was, it was for, for its time, it was, it was a great little shop, you know, and just, just like, but like so many other shops, they come and they go. Well, I want to thank you for, uh, you know, sharing what you could about Heroes World. I know, you know, we had, uh, you know, different different experiences, a different frame of reference when it comes to the store. I get the sense, you know, it didn't, it wasn't as meaningful to you, certainly, as it was to me. But I'm glad that we were able to kind of compare notes on it. Um, you know, again, for me, it, it's, it's where this whole journey started and obviously where this season is starting. And... You know, I've, I've really been looking at this season of the podcast as really the culmination of, of what I'm calling the alternate reality saga, uh, just as Avengers Endgame wrapped up the Infinity War <laughs> saga. You know, um, kind of every the story that we've been telling, I feel like this is sort of uh, everything's coming full circle with, with this season. So I'm excited to... Uh, continue revisiting, uh, you know, these, these shops, you know, from my youth. I hope people uh, enjoy coming along for the ride. Steve, I want to thank you for being part of this episode. I wish I had more to give you, but uh, I, after the mics go off, then I can tell you what I, I mean. don't want to hear it then. <laughs> it's now or never, my friend. Okay. And once again, my entire conversation with Kevin Halstead will be available as the Patreon exclusive bonus episode. It'll be available uh, one week from today on Wednesday, June 19th. And Steve and I are going to keep talking in the My Comic Shop History After Show, also available on Patreon. And then, of course, we will be back here with an all-new regular episode of My Comic Shop History in two weeks. Until then, don't be a flat squirrel. If you like what you hear, please consider joining the My Comic Shop History Patreon page. I know we're all subscribed to a million different services these days, but your Patreon support helps me cover the costs associated with maintaining the podcast. Plus you get access to a ton of exclusive bonus content starting at the $1 level, including the My Comic Shop Book Club, Beyond My Comic Shop, and My Super Fan History subseries. If you enjoy the regular episodes, I promise you'll dig the Patreon ones. Thanks to everyone who has already signed up. (laughs) 